here at the end of the Midwest LSA Expo, we got a chance to fly the Czech Sport Aircraft Sport Cruiser. Now, this is an airplane that lots of people know as the Piper Sport, and indeed, it's one of the nice things you can say about this particular design is that it was good enough for Piper. But I want to say that it has had continuous representation in the United States through the company called U.S. Sport Aircraft. And they have represented this airplane before Piper got involved. They were involved in the background at, while Piper was involved. And since Piper exited the light sport aircraft uh, sector, uh, U.S. Sport Aircraft has continued right on. And they are enjoying some pretty good sales, they report. So that's a great thing. They are in the number four position in ranking of registered light sport aircraft, special light sport aircraft in the United States with almost 200 units flying. And I'm sure there's a few more than that that just haven't made it onto the registry. That information is at the end of 2012. So we know they've got at least that many more flying overseas. So this is a company with four or 500 units, a comfortable number I believe I could support saying that they've had that many flying and uh, they are enjoying a good run of success with it. Uh, it's a nice, smooth, well-built airplane. There are a certain amount of fiberglass parts on it, but almost the whole airplane, you can see from its um, rivets going down the wing, this is an almost all-metal airplane. It uses the conventionally aspirated, that is carbureted, 912, 100 horsepower Rotax engine. They've got a three-blade Sensenic prop on it, an American-made prop, and in fact, a lot of the parts on the airplane, I'm told, are American-sourced. We'll have a look at the panel, but the panel's almost all American too, with Dyna dual screens and uh, Garmin 696 in the middle. We'll look at that when we get inside the airplane. Nose wheel steering is done by a free castering nose wheel, and uh, you use differential braking then to steer the airplane. It's uh, very easy to use. Uh, maybe one downside is that you can't push this airplane backwards very well. So you're either gonna need to pull it forward or have a technique that you can use on hard surface uh, to push it backwards. Uh, that's not a big deal, but it is one aspect of it, although there are people that like free castering nose wheels, and there are people that don't. You need to decide that yourself. So with this Rotax 912 engine, uh, Gerald tells us that he typically burns anywhere from about five and a half to down to about four, depending on altitude and where he's got the power set. You have 30 gallons on board. Here's the fuel point for 15 gallons, and there's another one on the other side, so there's your 30 gallons of fuel. So that's good for five, six or so hours of flying and the airplane can run near the top of the category at 120 knots. That would be using a little more fuel, so maybe a bit less than that if you're being economical about your usage, but you get a long range out of it. Gerald and his wife operate this airplane as a cross-country airplane. They fly at all kinds of places. When they do, they can carry some stuff in this wing locker here, and there's one on the other side as well. Of course, you can't get at that in flight, but it does hold 44 pounds of gear, depending on how you have the airplane loaded otherwise, of course. In addition, you've got a hat rack in the rear of the uh, what might be called a baggage compartment and then some space behind the seats where you can put a fair amount of stuff and it's relatively easy to get at. All low-winged airplanes have a couple of drawbacks to them relative to that. The entry to the airplane means you need to step up on the wing. For those people that are not as flexible or not as strong as they used to be, uh, that does present some challenges for some people and maybe they need to look at other airplanes but there is good hand holes uh, to do that and it's a sturdy airplane to climb up on. Once you get into the airplane, in order to load baggage into that area back there, you're gonna have to be in the airplane and maybe have somebody hand stuff to you or lay it on the wing behind you. That's a little bit more awkward than in a, say, a high-winged airplane where you might do that. But remember, you do have these storage lockers outside, so perhaps you can make your uh, travel gear fit in that space and that would be very, very easy to load. The all metal constructed wing, you can see the whole wing is metal, the whole fuselage is metal, the whole tail plane is metal. Just a few fiberglass parts like uh, the nose cowling and landing gear uh, wheel pan. Uh, flaps here in the center, electrically driven flaps with an indicator right alongside it, very clearly marked as we saw during the flying portion. Uh, so electric positions. We did make a landing here with no flaps down. Now most light sport aircraft, in fact most aircraft, land with some amount of flaps all the time. That's standard procedure. People go away from that only in gusty conditions where they want to make sure they have a little better penetration, a little higher speed as they get down to the ground. But even though we had flaps up, our ground roll wasn't that long and our touchdown speed was virtually the same. So it was an interesting demonstration that Gerald gave us. In order to enter the airplane, you've got a step down here and there's one on each side and you've got a nice sturdy handhold here. This is a very substantial part of the aircraft here. So step, not on the flap as it says, and then up here. And from there, we'll go one foot on the seat sit on the back of the seat and ease ourselves down in. So here I'm up on the wing, 
down on the back of the seat just sit on it there's a nice sturdy handhold right here that you can use to position yourself and of course you got the side put your feet around the rudder pedals and just slide down into the seat pretty easy nice comfortable seats with seat cushions that come well forward on the seat so you get a good comfortable position so once you're in the seat first of all the joystick position is just wonderful it's right where you want it you can just lay your arm down on the uh, on your lap you've got a center arm rest for someone in the right seat flying this way if you're doing it this way you do not currently have an arm rest over here so there's no support for the arm here however the newest models that are coming out have changed that and have put an arm rest there so that'll be a nice change that's not in this particular airplane uh, we've also got now that i'm seated in position these seats do not adjust they're up against a bulkhead they're comfortable seats and they're in a nice position and they hold the body well but in order to accommodate pilots of different size, there's a handle under here. My hand is grabbing it now. As I pull on that handle, I'm releasing it. And when I do, the pedals will come all the way forward. And then you just push down to wherever you want them. Release that. And they'll, there's an audible click. And you, can, and you can feel that click as well in case you're in the air. And uh, now the pedals are way out there. And my legs are almost straight touching the rudder pedals. On the top of the rudder pedals, if you can see down on this side, you've got tow brakes on, on both sides of the aircraft. And of course, that's important because that's how you steer this airplane on the ground using tow brakes. So once you've adjusted your rudder pedals, you can also adjust your position in the seat pretty well with a nice handhold here you can see I'm in. And that's a sturdy component. I'm pulling on it real firmly there. So between that and the center console, you can adjust a lot of things. You've also got a little bit of room in the center console here so you can put some more stuff as you like there. So as we move forward here across the T-intersection and up to the panel, throttle, which has a friction lock right here, I'm pulling back, and there is a knurled piece right here, so as you move it forward, it'll kind of lock down in position, or you can move it more freely by pinching on that. Uh, choke is to the right here, fuel selector valve, carburetor heat, which is unusual on a 912 engine. They don't often have that at all and don't really need it. Uh, cabin heat is right here, and to the side here, if you can see underneath the parachute handle, here's the flap. Uh, selector and right alongside it is the flap indicator which is nicely labeled with 0, 10, 20 and 30 degrees of flaps. You can see that very well. You can also just look out at the wing on either side and see the flaps visually. So switches here, we start with a master switch and then we kind of flow to the side here. Instrument avionics autopilot, it does have an autopilot, the Dynon autopilot is located up here. This just activates the autopilot so that then you can turn it on in flight. Strobe, nav lights, landing lights, and fuel pump. Above that, we have the transponder, the Dynon D100, the D120. This shows you instru engine instrumentation. This shows you uh, your primary flight display, but they can be swapped around. That's common in the Dynon world. Uh, in addition, we've got an autopilot on this aircraft, and one of the nice features about it is after you turn the autopilot on, that means that that's gives power to that. Now you turn it on here, but it says right underneath it, hold 180. It's one of the features that Dynon has offered on their airplanes. So if a pilot is flying along and is not instrument rated, and for whatever reason, some clouds come up quickly on him that he just didn't foresee or she didn't foresee, you can always press and then just hold that autopilot button. It will engage the autopilot, it will hold the altitude, and it will turn you around 180 degrees and fly you back the way you were going. You were in clear space, so that'll get you back to clear space. It's a really nice feature for those that get in a little over their head. You should be paying attention and not do that, but we all make mistakes. There's a nice way to remedy the problem. The two Dynon instruments, these are the seven inch screens. They're a little smaller than we see in the big sky views, which are available on this airplane at a little higher cost. Uh, but these instruments present a lot of information and it's very, very readable and easy to pick up information. They flank the Garmin, in this case, it's a 696, and you can see I won't remove it here, but this little lever right here, if I push down on that, that instrument will come out. You can take it into your hotel room at night while flying cross country, program it for your next flight, do all your flight legs, check your weather, do other things with it, and uh, then bring it back in the airplane, plug it in, you're kind of ready to go right away. So a nice moving map display here with lots of other features. Now the Garmin is updated to the 796, but it's essentially the same instrument. The big difference in the 796 is it's touchscreen, whereas this uses more buttons. And then finally, the Garmin radio down below. Backing that up are two instruments here, the airspeed indicator, the altitude. Uh, this is a, a simple airspeed indicator, a simple altitude indicator with big numbers for thousands of feet, but it's just a backup to what you already see here. And the same thing with uh, airspeed indications right here. So. That's pretty much the review of the airplane. Of course, the magnetic compass in the top, and I'm told from friends at the FAA that they're finally going to tell us we don't need 
magnetic compasses anymore because these are capable of showing magnetic headings. So that takes us through the airplane, but let's, let's say this about it, that this is just one of the configurations, and this is kind of the middle configuration. We'll call this a uh, modest luxury airplane because it's not so expensive. If you want to have the big dyno-on screens and more elaborate equipment in the airplane, you can spend a little more and get all that stuff. Then it would go into the luxury class and be priced to boot. And there is also an all um, analog version that is round dial gauges that you can get that brings the price down quite modest and is at roughly the $100,000 point. This company, U.S. Sport Aircraft, has got something they call Sport Shore, uh, Sport Shares. And Sport Shares means that they will help you find a partner to own one of these airplanes in a partnership setting and they can provide some financing for you as well. So just in case you think something over $100,000 is going to be too much for you, think again because there might be ways to mitigate that cost for you as an individual and they're willing to help. Now one thing I want to point out here before we close up this video is that when you pull down on the cabin, I noticed that their technique was to kind of pull on the, uh, the struts a little bit. And you just, there's a little bit of resistance there, so you go ahead and pull on down. I'm not going to pull it all the way, but when I did, there's an overhead cover here that shields you from the sun. That's a nice feature. Nonetheless, it's a big old greenhouse effect, and it got warm in here quickly. Now, if you look down here, if the camera can see, I've got my hand on a little uh, butterfly valve kind of thing there, and there's a nice big opening, but I found that didn't bring in much air. At altitude, of course, it was fine once we got up to about 5,000 feet very comfortable, plenty of air coming in, that wasn't an issue. And it's not blistering hot here in Mount Vernon today, but it's warm. And as we got down to below, into pattern altitude and below, it was pretty warm in the cockpit. However, I'm told that they will now, uh, the newest versions will have uh, air inlets directly on the canopy, and that would be a very nice addition. It needs a little more air in the cockpit. <laughs> so let's do a quick review here, some of the performance parameters of the airplane. We did already mention the fuel burn on it, so we won't repeat that. But in climb out, the airplane was climbing quite steadily and nicely at about uh, six or 700 feet a minute. Um, and, and once we got up to altitude, we leveled off and we were seeing uh, probably 110, 115 at a relatively low altitude. I'm told that at altitudes, uh, Gerald has a private pilot license so he can fly above 10,000 feet, unlike a sport pilot can. And at that altitude, he says he sees 125 knots, which is legal at, at uh, no more than uh, continue, max continuous power. And at that, he has a fuel burn of only 4.2 gallons an hour. So that's kind of the maximum performance of the airplane is at the highest altitude you can go, you'll see 120 plus, which again is true airspeed and that makes it okay, it's legal. On the low end of the spectrum, it's a remarkably slow flying aircraft. As I look out to my right here, I'm seeing a very broad cord wing, a very wide wing, if you will. And that makes this airplane so that it can stall at only 32 knots that's what it says right here on the airspeed indicator, and that's what I saw on the Dynon while we were flying. So their placard numbers are accurate, and that is a very slow speed. At that slow speed, the airplane felt very comfortable. We did the most gentle of stalls, but it never really broke at all. I'm told that with, uh, with full flaps down and no power at all, and you pull it back more sharply, it will actually break, but its stall characteristics are definitely very nice. Stall uh, flap extension speed, by the way, is 75 knots, as we mentioned, on approach to landing. So the airplane has got a pretty wide performance parameter, and I want to repeat that Gerald and his wife use this as a use this particular airplane as a cross-country airplane. They fly it all over the place. It's a nice, comfortable airplane for two people. It gets good fuel economy. It's very stable in flight. It performs quite well within the category, and it could make a nice choice for you if this is your cup of tea. For more information than we've provided on this video, please go to ussportaircraft.com. I've got lots more information on this airplane and many other light sport aircraft. You can find that on bydanjohnson.com or bydanjohnson.com. Thanks a lot for joining us here at the Midwest LSA Expo.